There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response. This is session 104 in our series, Bridging Citizen Science and SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals uh, for 2030, Enhancing Public Education Action on the Climate Crisis. So there's a number of applications, of course, for science, citizen science, as being that. Uh, our, our interest is the climate crisis, uh, among other things. And so we're going to get in that today. And these are our wonderful speakers who've made time to spend with us today and tell us about their work. So welcome, Vivian, Sarah, and Priscilla. We'll, we'll get to you in a moment. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open collaboration of, of libraries, library advocates, doing interesting things, we think, with technology. Um, we've been in business for uh, since 2007. We've been, we started out working on uh, connectivity issues. We initiated a, a campaign in the U.S. called Fiber to the Library. Basically said, the smartest thing we can do for infrastructure and equity is to connect all 17,000 public libraries with next generation fiber. And we're still working on that. <laughs> but it is uh, that there, there was really nothing you could do that would serve more people more quickly for less investment than connecting the public libraries because they serve so many people. And at the same time, connecting them extends the physical infrastructure out into communities. We then uh, partnered with others in the schools and health uh, area and formed an uh, advocacy group in, in D.C. called the Schools, Health, and Libraries Broadband Coalition, advocating that same approach, which then became policy in 2009 with support of federal investments and then advocacy around uh, connectivity with the FCC and, and on and on. But uh, lately, we've we've looked beyond just connectivity, which is an essential thing. Uh, we're we're delving into AI, and here for our purposes, libraries in response was formed in response to the pandemic in March of 2020. It was, you know, we started with the question: Well, okay, what is a library if the building is closed? It's not nothing, but what? So that was that led to an interesting conversation about how to, how libraries serve their communities without having the doors open. So there's online, there's turning the routers out the window is the obvious first thing to do, and then there's you know curbside, all those things that uh, that, that uh, happened uh, as we were all. It's hard to remember actually the state of mind that we were in when the pandemic was declared, and so many people were falling deadly ill uh, from this virus and we just didn't know how deadly it was or what was what we were going to do about it it was a real real moment so it was more libraries in reaction at the moment and then then libraries started to respond and develop plans and and then later that same year we felt like we were kind of coming out of it and we sort of shifted the the the, the tide of the libraries in recovery well that was a little premature or because we had variations of this virus coming along. Uh, Delta, I believe, was the one that just waylaid so many people. So we decided not to you know, count any chickens and retreated into response and how libraries respond to crisis. And that's what's the, that's the thread of this uh, whole campaign now, four plus years old. And as you saw, 100 episodes in, uh, with over 10,000 registrations and more than that uh, in uh, video views on our YouTube channel, Libraries and Response YouTube. You can find them all there recorded. And that's where this will be tomorrow or the next day. Our partner in this production since the beginning is IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, and at the helm is uh, Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA, and a longtime ally in various campaigns around connectivity and this. So 
Thank you, Stephen. And our sponsor this year, our principal sponsor this year is uh, IMLS, the Federal Library Agency in the U.S. that has uh, come in to bring support to the campaign, to the advocacy. This is our metaphor for libraries, the Swiss Army Knife of public institutions. Uh, it's hard to summarize what a library is, you know. Just tell me what a library is, you know, do three words. You know. Well, it's pretty tough uh, because you can just say books, but that's no longer, that's, I mean, it's true, but it's, it's a subset. It's a, it's a huge subset of, of what libraries do, uh, which are ever more things. Our focus has been on libraries responding to crises, starting with COVID, and then it just went on from there. Uh, there was, we had uh, a social crisis uh, from after the Floyd murder and a few months after the pandemic was declared to be an economic crisis, had a political crisis. Uh, and then, well, I'm, I, this needs to be updated. This needs to be 2024 there. Apologize for that. COVID is not through with us. It's still out there morphing around and uh, shifting. And, you know, it's not done. AI is the new crisis to the scene. Uh, it's just popped up. It's not like it's brand new. It's just that it's been in the background for quite a few years now, running all kinds of algorithms uh, through the internet on data right. and people and so on. Now it's, you know, it's come to the front as a end user access. And that's, that's been the big news. So we've done, we've done a bunch of sessions on AI. We've done over a dozen AI sessions and a lot of people are trying to figure this out. And I haven't found anybody that really knows what's going on or can say what, what's going to be happening. I've got, everybody has an idea, but doesn't seem to be a consensus on that. But behind all of these or all that is, uh, is the climate. This is, it, it really almost trivializes every other crisis because it's everywhere. And uh, it's been there for a long time. Major climate changes are inevitable and irreversible. I mean, that's, that's not what will happen if we don't do something. That's what is happening. That's what's already happened. And it's it's going to get worse. We're a harbinger of uh, bad news on this program. I have to apologize for that, but it's the fact. And uh, we did a we did a project with the uh, with the federal uh, library agency on libraries as second responders. You know, you get your aunt, police, ambulance, fire, so forth. First responders. Well, in a large scale event, first responders are overwhelmed. And then everybody becomes a responder. And so libraries being among everyone uh, have played roles, planned or unplanned, in large-scale events. So we were, we were preparing a proposal to uh, explore that, use communication strategies, backup energy and so forth, backup electricity and so forth. And there, we had a response was, well, we're already overloaded. Why do we want to take that on? point taken however people are going to show up at your door like it or not so you should be ready you should think about these things and uh try to prepare so that's that's just the the fact of the matter these are this is just what's happening around this is now one year old slide i think you know fires and floods and hurricanes and droughts incredible winds is Derecho, everybody ever heard of that before a few years ago or even now? It's just a huge wind blowing straight across the landscape. There was a wind there uh, that wiped out 40% of the Iowa corn crop in one night, just like that. Wow. These are, there are all these weather terms, you know, just unfamiliar to me, to most people. You know, heat dome. I'd never heard of a heat dome. Now everybody's heard of a heat dome if they're not, you know, probably living under one. So it's it's serious, and uh, we need solutions. The the large we need the largest players to step up and convince everybody that this is really happening, and that we as a 
as a species need to take responsibility for it and do something about it to slow it down, to stop it, maybe to reverse it, at least to slow it down. Well, they're not. They're, uh, you know, here and there a little bit, but it's not enough. We're, we're still adding more and more, more than ever, carbon into the atmosphere. We haven't even stopped increasing our amount of contribution of carbon in the atmosphere. So it also happens at the local level. So the last point I'll make on this is that there's only so much an individual can do to mitigate this circumstance. It really is going to take the, the biggest financial institutions, the biggest governments to lead the way. But each of us, each facility, each household, each person can do something to adapt. And so the adaptation side scales all the way, all the way up and down. And that's where we think libraries really can lead. But today we're going to see how mitigation itself can be decentralized and effective. So here we are. And um, it's time to hear from our speakers. Uh, Vivian, I believe, is going to run the slides. And then we'll hear from... Vivian, Sarah, and Priscilla, maybe in that order, or maybe in different order. They haven't they haven't figured out. Priscilla, by the way, is uh, and, and please each of you, you know, add an introduction. Uh, these links go to your uh, LinkedIn, which are in the uh, invitation. But please add a little bit about you know, kind of how you got into the world of libraries. I, it's always interesting to me to hear that background. I do want to add one more thing there. Uh, Fritz uh, Einfeld provided this really nifty little illustration we've used with attribution. So I'm stopping the share and turning it over to Vivian to take us away. involved in the field, and then there's the, the thing focused on the library. Uh, and Stephen. The, um, I think that was Sam was repeating what you just said. Let me see if I can mute um, Stephen. Yeah, so I, I suppose I'm just going to Steven, I got him. Okay, power, power. Please, Vivian. Vivian. Good morning, everyone. I'm Vivian Brown. I'm Vivian from Los Angeles Public Library, and um, I am our system-wide lead for our STEM and neighborhood science initiatives. And um, very happy to be here. I became a librarian after spending five, six years in telecommunication industry. And uh, it just, I decided to come back to become a librarian because uh, my, during my high school and um, college years, I was working in the library as a, as a pager that I was shelving books. And, you know, and that was like the places I really enjoy being at uh, as, as my work. And so when, at that turning point in the 2000 when the dot-com bubble burst, I started thinking about what do I wanted to do next? And my father who passed already is the one who, who enlightened me and just telling me, I remember the last time you're very happy to go to work was when you're working in the library. So I went back and finished my master's in, in, um, with an MLIS degree in, in the library and since and I'm going on my 20th year very soon. So very happy. And I'm going to pass it on to Priscilla so you can introduce yourself. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Priscilla Poon. Uh, I'm currently the uh, secretary of uh, EFA and SLEEP, uh, then Environment, Sustainability, and Library Sections. And um, I actually, I, I joined the uh, EFA since I think uh, 2018. And at that time, I joined the other sections. I joined the uh, cataloging sections and also acquisition sections uh, at, at EFA. And since 2021, um, uh, I joined the Ensolip section. Uh, and it's also the year that the, it's all the, also the first year that the Ensolip uh, became an, a section. Before that, uh, it's just a, a SIG and a special interest group. So it's very, um, we, we, are, we are glad that um, uh, the sustainability and, and the climate change will pay more attention uh, to, uh, to, to the public and also to the library field. Um, yeah, I basically, I, um, I 
I personally work in the, uh, Macau uh, in China. I work as the uh, technical process. Uh, so um, it's about the uh, collection development. And I also uh, working for some uh, information literacy. Uh, so uh, work to working to promote the um, uh, some education for sustainability, sustainable development is also um, a part of my 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 job, and I I would also like to to see in the future uh, what we can we can do, yeah. So I'm good that I have the chance to, uh, to share some uh, current works uh, of Ensuli today. Yes, thank you. And Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Troublehorn. I'm the Sciences Librarian at San Diego State University and uh, the co-founder and chair of our new sustainability committee in our library. I, um, as a disclaimer, am a relatively new librarian. Uh, although I have been involved in sustainability initiatives in my research, I'm a trained ichthyologist, marine biologist, um, and I've had ties all throughout my working career um, in sustainability. And when I uh, consider sustainability, I'm not just thinking about um, the environmental aspects, I'm thinking about the social equity and economic aspects too. Um, and I really do like the quote from um, Project Drawdown that every job is a climate job. So that's kind of what um, my philosophy is on everything. So I think I'm going to hand it back now to um, Vivian to do the slides and Priscilla to take us away. Priscilla, you can go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I'm just uh, very happy to, to be here and also to uh, share with you uh, in, in maybe 10 minutes about the uh, Ensuleaf's current work and what Ensuleaf has been done there in the past years. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is something that I, I would like to share with you, uh, including the uh, our signature projects, uh, EFA Green Library Award, and also um, uh, the Green Library definition and uh, some of the other current projects, including uh, book projects and the uh, uh, guidelines uh, for green and sustainable libraries. Next slide. So the first thing uh, is the uh, signature project just mentioned uh, is the IFA Green Library Award, uh, which is founded in uh, 2016 uh, by IFA and Sulip. Um, actually, it's a, um, a, a project, uh, its objectives is to uh, reward the green libraries uh, or green library projects uh, that best communicate their commitment to the environmental sustainability. And it also um, would like to create awareness of the um, library social responsibility and the environmental education uh, in global and, and local levels. And uh, for this award, uh, we have uh, two categories. Uh, first category is about the uh, Green Library and the uh, Grand Scale Projects. And the uh, second category is about the uh, Green Library Projects. So um, if necessary, uh, we will also uh, award to, uh, we will also give a, a special recognition, uh, which is um, an award uh, to the projects or Green Libraries with minimum resources. Uh, but uh, with a big impact uh, to the uh, society. Looks nice, please. Uh, so uh, normally uh, we will uh, call for submissions for, for this award in November or December. And then in the following year, in around April, uh, we will release the uh, shortlist, uh, submission, shortlist submission. And then in around May, we will uh, list it the uh, 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 shortlisted uh, submissions. So uh, for the time being, uh, it's June, uh, we already released our shortlisted submissions uh, for 2024. Uh, there are eight submissions being shortlisted uh, this year. Uh, so for the final winners, uh, we are going to release the uh, results uh, in the coming October in Barcelona. Uh, there will be an uh, event uh, uh, for the uh, Ensuli uh, in, in Barcelona uh, with the other uh, EFA sections. 
So you can click on uh, this link or go to the website of our uh, of Insulate. You can find more information about our future conference. Next slide, please. Seems that the is it a video? No. Okay. Oh, okay. It's good. Maybe it's I'm not large. sure why it's not showing that slide. Do you want to just talk through it? So, but the next slide works. <laughs> yeah. So yes. Okay. Sure. You might try to show anyway, and it may just lose. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you may you may show yes yes you may show something like this yes and then i can yeah uh, so i just um sharing about the uh, green library award uh so um the the final result will be released and then the second round of uh of the ifa green library award will will, will start in uh, in the end of this year so if um you still have chance to uh, send us your submissions and the other projects uh, is uh, about the Green Library definition. Um, Ansolib has uh, released a Green Library definition uh, in 2021. Um, in, in this definition, uh, you may see um, a Green Library uh, refers to a green and sustainable library, uh, which takes into account the environmental, economic, and social sustainability. And um, you can find the details uh, on our website. And there are about uh, already 30 translations of our Green Library definition. Uh, so uh, you can uh, choose the, your native language uh, of, of these documents. Next slide, please. And our Green Library definitions uh, follow the uh, triple bottom line framework uh, for sustainabilities. As you may see, uh, we, we could also uh, divide the uh, 17 UN SDGs uh, into the uh, uh, three uh, three categories. I mean, the uh, uh, triple bottom line framework, uh, environment, society, and economy. Next slide, please. And uh, we also uh, have a Green Library website. Uh, you may uh, throughout this website, you may have a look on uh, some reference materials, uh, checklist, or, or some um, current projects uh, related to uh, green libraries. Um, you can you can have a look um, and and communicate with us uh, throughout this website. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, on our Green Library website, uh, you can find a poster project. Uh, here is two examples. Uh, one is the, the left side, the one on the left side is from uh, Germany. Uh, and the one on the uh, right side is from uh, University of Macau. Uh, so you will see uh, the two posters, uh, they are follow the uh, similar framework uh, of the triple bottom line um, uh, sustainabilities and also follow the uh, uh, Ansu Lips Green Library definitions, uh, but they fill up uh, with some um, uh, local activities uh, of a particular libraries. So um, if you, you would like to tell us about your story, you can also submit your, your poster to us. Uh, we have some uh, poster sample and templates on our Green Library website. So you can, uh, you're welcome to, to submit a, your, mm -hmm. your story to us. And uh, in the coming slides, I would like to highlight some of the Ansolid common projects. Uh, the first one is about the EFA guidelines for green and sustainable libraries. Um, we are now seeking suggestions and expectations uh, of these guidelines from the public. 
uh, it aims to uh, provide a set of concrete recommendations and best practices that can be applied to libraries or information centers of any size and any type. Also, uh, if you have any uh, suggestions in the in our uh, beginning stage, uh, you are welcome to uh, send us uh, your your suggestions or expectations uh, before fifteen September this year. And the other projects I would like to highlight is about the uh, book projects. Um, we we are going to launch our uh, new books uh, of Ansolip uh, in the coming October, uh, in the coming September uh, or October uh, in Brisbane and in Barcelona. And the book titles um, are currently, the tentative book titles is uh, Libraries Driving Education for a Sustainable Development. ESD as a guiding principles for management programs and services. Uh, we have collected about uh, 20 book chapters uh, uh, for, for, for this book. And we uh, divided this book into uh, three parts. Uh, the first part is about uh, some general idea of uh, ESD, uh, including the uh, paradigm shift uh, in the uh, past decades, and also some uh, general uh, examples. And the uh, second part uh, is about the uh, examples from uh, public libraries and uh, school libraries from uh, different uh, part of the world. Yes. And we have also the third part. The third part is uh, basically uh, for the academic libraries and LIS education. Yes, you can uh, see we have uh, different examples uh, uh, from <laughs> different parts of the countries. Uh, once I get to your <laughs> yes, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, on top of the uh, current book projects, uh, Ansolips has also uh, uh some uh, book projects have been done uh, in the past few years. So you can access to our website and to have a look on those books. They are all open access. And the final part I would like to highlight is about the conference. I made uh, just uh mentioned, uh, we have uh, two conferences uh, in this year. Uh, the first one uh, show in this slide is uh, the one uh, on 6 uh, to 9 uh, October this year in Barcelona. Uh, in, in this event, in this uh, conference, we are going to uh, release the final results of our Green Library Award uh, 2024. And um, the, here is uh, the tentative uh, agenda. Uh, so we are going to have more information released on the websites. And the second conference is in Brisbane. Uh, this one uh, we, is actually a, a associated event of the EFA Information Future Summits. Uh, it will be held uh, on 27th to 29th September. Um, if you want to have a look uh, in further details, you can uh, go to our website uh, to check the uh, uh, details, information. Next nice, please. So um, I would also like to let you know that um, we also have different uh, kinds of um, projects, including EFA and Sulip newsletters, uh, which is uh, we, we publish twice in a year. Uh, we are going to have our June issue uh, released uh, in this month. Uh, but anyway, you are you are you are feel free to uh, you feel you are welcome to submit your articles uh, to us anytime, and uh, we also have our IFA and Solid webinar series. Uh, it's irregularly, uh, but uh, normally we we are, we have uh, four webinar sections in a in a year. Uh, so if you have any uh, potential speakers or you you, you would like to uh, share your story with us, you just uh, let us know so we can um, uh, have a uh, webinar uh, for you. Uh, so um, please also uh, subscribe to our mailing list uh, so to get informed about our activities and related events uh, from all around the world. And by following, uh, if you, you want to have uh, more information about us and um, besides uh, subscribe to our mailing list you can also uh, just follow our social medias uh, you can just scan the QR code to to follow our social media next slide please and um, 
that's the end uh, of my sharing. So uh, I would like to uh, end my presentation uh, with a with a quote, uh, with a quote from an Indian author. So uh, next slide, please. Or oh, it's already the the end. But anyway, uh, the quote uh, I, I would like to share with you. Uh, it says, uh, education turns an empty mind into an open mind. It turns information into behavior transformation. So we think um, education is uh, important, uh, especially uh, in, in this uh, changing world. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I pass to Vivian. That's great, Priscilla. Oh, That's I fantastic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> The uh, so Insulab is uh, it's open, right? I mean, you don't have actual membership. You just subscribe to the newsletter, and then you can take advantage of any of the Insulab materials, and that's it. As well as submit proposals. Is that? I'm trying to understand how organ how it functions organizationally. Do you do you join Insulab, or you just subscribe? Yes. To the newsletter? Yes, we, we have uh, different types of uh, journey. And so you can uh, just it, uh, follow follow our social media so you can, as an audience, uh, to to learn the information uh, uh, on, on, on the related topics. Or if you would like to uh, get involved with us, it, it also means that you can work with us. For example, um, you, you, you would like to uh, maybe join our, for example, our projects. Uh, for example, if you you would like to share the share your your story with us, you can and we can have work work together to to hold an webinar series, and or you have some uh, particular things you would like to uh, make it a project, uh, just like um bibliographic tools or or work uh, our guidelines you would like to work with us, uh, for particular topics, uh, you you can just uh, contact with us so we can see the possibility. Uh, to and, and see how to present it uh, as a project or to, to work further on it. Wonderful, wonderful. It's always uh, been attractive to us, uh, kind of exciting to us that the, the library sits at the heart of a community is such a natural place, a uh, laboratory for green tech. It's like it's like a demo site live, you know, anything that's coming along, you can show it there. You can you can open the inside of the building and, you know, have people come and say, oh, this is what they were talking about with, you know, uh, heat, uh, heat sinks and, and solar panels or whatever. The library is just there to be an open uh, demo and lab for testing them out. So it's, it's great. Um, as far as events, we will try to contribute to the cause, generally speaking, uh, we have uh, Bill McKibben scheduled for coming back on uh, end of the year, either November or December of this year. He'll be coming back, visiting with us and telling us, you know, how it's going, giving us the the good news. Somehow he can find good news and all the bad news. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks. So uh, carry on, uh, Vivian. Who's who's up next? I am. <laughs> All right. Jump right in. <laughs> so I am going to take everyone into the world of citizen science. And again, thank you for the opportunity. So uh, we're going to start by telling, uh, start by uh, dive into what citizen science actually means. So citizen science has many names, community science, street science, people science, uh, it all involves in, uh, involves public participation in genuine scientific research. This collaboration helps advance scientific knowledge by turning everyday curiosity into meaningful impact. The term citizen science has sparked some debate in the citizen science communities for quite some time, mainly because it sounds like you need to be a citizen of a country or a place to join in. Last year, the US-based Citizen Science Association took the lead and officially rebranded as the Association of Advancing Participatory Sciences, or AAPS. This change is paving the way for a shift to a more welcoming, inclusive term, participatory science. For that reason, I will be using participatory science, citizen science, and also our, our uh, initiatives, neighborhood science, 
for most of the part uh, interchangeably for the most part of this presentation. So through global participation and participatory science projects, we under uncover a lot of fascinating insights. For example, we found out that bird population have halved over recent years, various species of breed earlier, and our study, some of the citizen science project studies also reveal that there are over 50 types of bacteria that live in human belly button. So, um, and also in advance, uh, in addition, we noted that there are earlier flowering in numerous plant species, which all illustrate illustrating significant environment shifts. So why citizen science and public libraries? By integrating participatory science, public libraries can transform their existing STEM and STEAM programs. This not only promotes lifelong learning, but also increased public engagement with real world issues that are close to home, fostering community connections and drive environmental stewardship. Most importantly, libraries are becoming key player, a key player in advocating for open science beyond providing access to scientific information and supporting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We've all working towards the 17 UN SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals, but we need to stop and ask, do people really know what the SDGs are, the general public? Are we on track to achieve them? What, I mean, where should we put more efforts or, and resources? And where do we push for change, changes in policy? Now, answering these questions require timely, relevant, and reliable data. And even though we have this global indicator framework with the 231 unique indicators to monitor progress with the SDGs, we're still facing big challenges in tracking these goals effectively. Many countries, including those well-developed, rely on what we call the traditional data sources to track the progress of the 17 SDGs. But these methods often come up short. They're la they lack of timeliness, they're not inclusive, and they need this infrastructure to be built out. It's very costly and slow to set up. And this is unfortunately especially true for environmental indicators, where um, according to United Nations Environment, 68% are lacking data right now. And that leaves a big gaps in our understanding. But with citizen science, this is where citizen science can come in. It's a cost-effective and broad-reaching solution that can re really change the game and how we monitor the SDGs progress. By bringing these program, if when we bring citizen science program into public libraries, we're not just teaching people about the SDGs, we're getting them directly involved in the data collection process. And it's working. Research, research has shown that participatory science is really significantly boosting our data collection. Um, already contributing or could contribute to around 33% of all SDG indicators. And what's more is that every single SDG has at least one indicator that could be tracked through citizen science. Also, participatory, participatory science volunteers, they also play a crucial role in driving local progress uh, towards sustainable development. So aside from collecting data, assessing SDG progress, and leveraging local expertise through participatory monitoring, uh, monitor, monitor, monitoring uh, methods. The volunteer also model positive behaviors and attitudes, enhancing their knowledge and willingness to contribute to the SDGs locally. They can help mobilize other people in the community, foster that sense of opportunity and ownership regarding the challenges our community faces. And the participatory science volunteers also increase, help us increase in um, community engagement, foster, again, foster that local ownership in developing solutions, building resilience and strengthening that preparedness we need. With all that thought, so in 2018, Los Angeles Public Library launched a new initiative we call Neighborhood Science or NASI for sure. We choose NASI over citizen science to clear up any confusion that only US citizens can participate in the programs. And we also wanna emphasize the community engagement piece of it. Neighborhood science is a key part of our full STEM ahead initiative, which focus on, focusing on fostering the interest for conservation and sustainable, sustainable, sustainability minded STEM uh, education. And our goal is really also to enhance the um, understanding of environmental issues and improve data literacy through active participation in citizen science. 
Neighborhood science is also about democratizing science, making it accessible and inclusive, give every community member a voice and a role in scientific research that affect their lives, strengthening community ties and build that lasting trust between scientists, policymakers, and the public. The Neighborhood Science Program at Los Angeles Public Library have made significant strides in supporting set 10 of the 17 SDGs. Now let's talk about what LAPO's NASA initiative entails. One of the key components in the Neighborhood Science Initiative is our STEM programs and outreach activities. They are designed to be fun and engaging and educating the public of all ages on the science behind various locally relevant environmental issues through practical participation. These programs range from ranging from indoor educational activities to outdoor data collection, fostering a hands-on understanding and appreciation of science and nature. To lower the barriers to entry, we also offer what we call do-it-yourself or DIY neighborhood science circulating kits, which allow the public to engage the environmental top with environmental topics with their at their own pace. These kits now available at about 39 of our 73 locations, covering locally relevant, relevant topics such as air and water quality, light pollution measuring, uh, mosquito habitat mapping, urban heat and fact and tree height measuring, and exploring uh, biodiversity. All of these are to empowering our community members to learn and explore independently. Partnerships are crucial to the success of our neighborhood science initiative. By collaborating with organizations at the federal, state, and local levels, we're not, we've not, not only enhanced the content and the reach of our programs, but also deepen that community's awareness and, of and connection to environmental concerns that are impacting their quality of life. Turning to a specific example, the LA BioBliss Challenge we launched in 2021 with the Biodiversity Research Team of the City Sanitation and Environmental and Environment Depart Department. This challenge has now become a citywide tradition, engaging the, the community to document local biodiversity using tools, um, the citizen science tool called iNaturalist. This month-long campaign not only fills critical data gaps, but also help educate and unite the community in preserving and understanding our local ecosystems. For those of you who are new to the term BioBlitz, it's basically an event where scientists and the communities come together to identify as many species as possible in a set area over a set period of time. So why do we launch a citywide BioBlitz challenge? The challenge itself is really a motivating call to action for a greener, more connected Los Angeles. Our goal are goals are straightforward. We want to raise awareness of urban biodiversity within the city boundary, document the city's unique species, and fill biodiversity data gaps. And we also want to amplify the advantages people can benefit from LA's diverse ecosystem, which is measured by the city's biodiversity index. But it's, again, it's more than just data gathering. We want to invite all every Los Angeles residents to photograph local flora and fauna, not just to contribute to the scientific knowledge, but again, to unite our community and deepen the understanding of the environment we share. And this wealth of community source data is invaluable. It provides the city planner and policymakers with the insights that's needed to collaborate with our city's research team, ensuring the protection and conservation of our urban wildlife and habitats. So it's, it's about making that informed decision to safeguard our natural heritage for our future generations. So in order to complete this challenge, participants are asked to help turn this biodiversity observation heat map that you see on the right here from white to green by exploring their neighborhoods and making and sharing 10 observations using iNaturalist citizen science app. Of these 10 observations they submitted, Three has to be what we call the indicator species. And of the same 10 observations, one has to be made in what we call the observation or data close spot. Here's a quick summary of what LA BioBliss Challenge have accomplished in for the last three years. And uh, we're on track to start to kick off our fourth one this October. And these numbers will be shared uh, uh, with our uh, participants along with three top three most observed indicator species and number of the unique indicator species observed. We share them through our social media, iNaturalist journal posts, and the challenge website. 
if you look at the number here, the 2023 challenge is by far the most successful one we've had um, with the highest observation average per week. So how are the data used when we collect them through um, the challenge? Any of the photo or sound data that our participants share through iNaturalist are analyzed and studied by the scientists in the city or the researchers to understand the presence and the spread of the species for mapping, analysis, and research, identifying critical conservation locations or potential areas of connectivity to allow species movement, and making that also making informed restoration and other types of conservation decisions. So for instance, observations of invasive weed species like fountain grass can help spur like weed uh, re removal projects, um, as you can see on as a, a photo that's on the far right. Also through anecdotal feedback that we got, we learned participants mentioned they learned about LA being located within one of the 36 remaining glo global biodiversity hotspots and what that means. They also start paying more attention to the issue and the frequency of rural kills at different parts of their neighborhoods. They know and learn about invasive species in their backyards and get super excited when they observe an endangered or indicator species. This graph here is shared by the GIS team of LA Department of Sanitation and Environment using the observation data from iNaturalist. And it really highlights the success of LA Biopolis Challenge compared to the annual city nature challenge hosted by the Natural History Museum of LA, uh, LA County or across the globe. And they're on track to celebrate their 10th anniversary, I believe. Um, so what you can see here on this uh, graph is the big spike is where the City Nature Challenge took place. And which, you know, that indicate the major participation. Now you will see the smaller spike with this little arrow that we're pointing to. That is the, um, the small but steady increasing spike each fall that, uh, from LA Biopolis Challenge. And this upward trend is very encouraging for us, who is continue to championing and running this this um this Bible challenge. It's showing that growing engagement impact over time. So now let's talk about the challenges of hosting neighborhood science or participatory science programs in public work and some of the approaches that we have taken to overcome them. So we quickly noticed there's an even participation, especially in the, the in, in our city. We did notice there's a stronger participation in more affluent neighborhoods. It is still so. So we're looking into the, one of the approach that we're doing is we're trying to make our program a little bit more appealing, uh, more appealing to all age groups and interests by varying the event times or the program times. And also we're conducting more outreach or offsite program to meet potential participants where they're at. The second problem we have is with the recruitment or intention so, um, of the participants. So what we're doing is we're trying to tie the, these projects that we're looking, we, we brought in, uh, uh, tie them to the community interests, offer more continuous learning, highlight benefits like uh, giveaway, milestone giveaways, digital badges, or volunteer hours. Uh, we also have issue with competing with other program, program slots in the library. So what we're trying to, tackle this is by planning way ahead. Um, also try to integrate citizen science into other existing programs, provide more uh, hybrid options, promote through display or outreach. And with technological barriers, we are choosing the projects that have low entry barriers. And we are working with project developers to try to standardize the measuring tool or monitoring tools. Um, provide, we are also looking to providing, we've already done that, sorry provide non-digital data collection options using paper paper and pencil, for instance. And we also provide, um, in the process of recording, short uh, video tutorials. For cultural and language barriers, we, we want to collaborate more with local community, more local community groups for their knowledge in the local uh, cultural heritage. We also um, work with our translation team to get most of our uh, content translated into at least seven different other languages. For data literacy issues, we partner with experts, uh, especially our partners, to train librarians and also offer public programs to teach about data collection and analysis 
And when possible, we work with project manager, uh, project developers to try to simplify the protocols uh, in terms of monitoring and without sacrificing the accuracy they're looking for. Lastly is the privacy concern. The two biggest concerns are um, providing email addresses and geotag for sharing their observations. So um, one way we, we did is by creating what we call the anonymous input options that's available on our, our website. And we're also trying to educate the public about the importance of uh, geospatial data with a new program that's in the process of it's about basic map making program using Google Maps. So that is the end of my um, my presentation. And I'm gonna end my presentation with a quote that I really like. And I think it's the essence, it really explains the essence of citizen science. It's tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn by Benjamin Franklin. Thank you. And now I'm gonna pass this to back to Don. We can't hear you for some reason. That's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful quote um, <laughs> of course, uh, from Franklin uh, and, a, and a wonderful program. It, it just, there's so many things on so many layers that seem to be happening there. You're, you're fostering science literacy. I mean, we really need people to be more objective and scientific in, in their understanding of the world. You're also finding potential scientists, real scientists, you know, who may really pursue an academic uh, career in, in science as a result of that. The other thing is that you're doing real science. This is not practice science. You're not asking questions of the answers at the back of the chapter. You know, this is like questions we don't have answers for. And that, that, and in my experience, that makes all the difference in motivation when people feel like they're, they're, asking and trying to answer questions that no one knows the answer for. So bravo. That's uh, great. Keep, keep, keep that up anyway. So, okay. Uh, Sarah, you're up. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you both to Priscilla and Vivian. Um, I just want to say that uh, both Entulib and Vivian have been a huge inspiration for me. I was um, at the IFLA World Conference last year in Rotterdam and met Vivian there for the first time. Um, and actually what I realized then was I have to really do something about the citizen science. It really, really inspired me. Um, and so this is really a very new program, and it was really on this what I heard last year um, at the IFLA conference. So I just want to say that this is like where my inspiration came from. So I'm going to just talk about today, um, and mine will be a, a whole lot more brief because um, Vivian has provided the background to participatory science. But what does this look like um, in terms of the SDGs and in an academic library? So before we could even tackle the citizen science and participatory science uh, part of it, we had to really understand what the SDGs are in context of an academic library. So what we started with was mapping the work that we are doing to the SDGs and um, really seeing where we stand as a benchmarking process. And then as part of that, identifying different ways that we can empower our community within that. So we really mapped day-to-day -day activities of what we are doing in our library to the SDGs, and then really uh, took that to see, okay, how do we develop the sustainability further? So next slide, please. So what we actually uh, did here was, this is a, a quick summary, um, and you'll see that it was very similar to uh, what Vivian had shown. And it was based on a template provided by the ALA a Task Force on United Nations 2030 Sus Sustainable Development Goals um, that is available on the ALA website. So I didn't even know where to start when I began this. And this is where I found this information was ready there and the LA Public Library. So I presented this last year, just this basic mapping that we did. Um, 
at ALA last year in my poster and why it was important. And really in terms of our participatory science, we identified four key areas and that was the quality education, reduced inequalities, climate action, which is obviously what we're focusing on here today and partnerships for the goals. But you'll see that in my programming, all of these kind of interplay. Next slide, please. So what are the intended outcomes of engaging in participatory science in academic library? So when we are looking, we're looking at our local community. So this is really our student and uh, faculty as well as our broader community. And we really are looking to engage them in STEM and sustainability and the SDGs. So I, we are looking, although I'm the sciences librarian, obviously this is STEM from my discipline. I am really looking to engage um, our community, not only in the sciences, but our entire community in this work that we're doing. It also ties into our library and our campus strategic plan goals, as well as our sustainability goals within the library. And one of the biggest things for me is that this is relationship building. The more that I'm working as a librarian, the more I'm realizing that my work is really foundational in relationship building. So that's kind of where um, these outcomes are for me. Next slide, please. So how did we identify projects? I'm not gonna obviously repeat any of um, what Vivian has said about the importance of these things and why citizen science is important. But um, what I really wanted to do was, I only heard about all of this at IFLA last year in August, and it was like, okay, my programming for the year, how are we gonna fit this in? So, um, it was actually Vivian that put me in touch with um, SciStarter because they were just really foundational in helping us get going because I knew nothing about how to do this. So they helped me really analyze um, how to go about this. So the scope of it was that I wanted to focus on local projects. So as local as possible, not just in San Diego, but in projects that were um, in our university. Um, and so also projects related to science and our health sciences librarians. So we used SciStarter to identify projects and worked with them closely. We chose low entry projects, which is what uh, Vivian had also mentioned. And the reason for this is because we didn't have a budget for this. This is outside the scope of my normal day-to-day -day work and um, time related. So I needed to get buy-in for people that it wasn't gonna be time consuming or cost money. And we focused on workshops in April this year because it is Citizen Science Month. So I figured that was a really nice time where we could just tie into that. And then from that, we just developed a resource guide um, for like public, for academic library use mainly. And um, I had four workshops planned for Citizen Science and Earth Month. And it turns out that um, our very first uh, month was actually spring break, so it didn't work very well. So I didn't even do the the, pro the planning very well. But from that, um, we I cut it down to th three of the most important things um, that we could do. And this was really just a pilot program. And um, I'll show you some of the stats at the end. And it was actually really exciting in terms of the relationships that we have been building. Next slide, please. So the very first one of us um, was the all of us. So you might ask um, why I've included this in a climate talk. And the reason is because very often our communities that are um, at highest risk in the impoverished areas are the ones that um, really are affected most by climate issues. So the all of us program, if anybody does not know, is run by the NIH. And the aim of it is to, prov to provide equitable health care to everybody. So they are really looking for data from everybody so that they can uh, provide solutions to our entire community. So um, we, and this ties into some of our programming in the library, we received a nice grant to be trained as the health and science librarians in how to teach our faculty and researchers into using the All of Us data. Um, and to use it equitably. And then we received a grant as part of um, a community collaboration with the academic, public and county libraries in San Diego uh, to do a um, 
sustainability programming and it came from all of us. So that is one of the reasons why we chose that. And it, this was really focused on data collection and the data collection came from uh, UC San Diego where they are actually processing this. So it was also local. So I did not run this workshop. It was run by the all of us. I just merely hosted it on our campus. Next slide, please. The next one that we chose was Litter Journal. And the reason why we chose this one was because our student sustainability uh, community had specifically requested something that was related to them. And they were very concerned about our plastic litter in our environment. So although this is uh, run by the South Carolina Aquarium, um, this information tracks all over the world. So it's actually something global that anybody can do. Um, it's really simple and our students really love it because they love apps is um, you download this Anecdata uh, app, you take a photograph of um, your litter where you find it um, and then you upload it into the app. And obviously this has the same concerns as uh, to them as Vivian had mentioned in terms of the data being shared, like your geo, like geo data and things like that. So um, a lot of the education behind this is as well, uh, is to just inform the student bodies um, of the privacy of this data and really to try and find, before we, we publish any of the information on these kind of workshops, is to really do the research behind it. How private is the information? What kind of information is going to be out there? Um, and really to get their buy-in and trust in this. So this was a student collaboration. And the aim of it is to provide, uh, improve health, promote habitat con conservation, and save wildlife, which were really important to what our student body had requested. Next slide, please. So the final one is very similar to what Vivian had mentioned, except that we didn't, we do not have a local bioblitz. Um, ours was using the, our workshop was on the iNaturalist and it was the very last weekend in April, which ties into Earth Day. And that is, um, as you saw in that slide that Vivian shared, the City Nature Challenge. So it was a little bit of a challenge for me to identify these projects in our um, area. And it was really kind of like this funny roundabout way um, of doing things. So I had sent out uh, to all of my faculty my lib guide and said, hey, I'm starting citizen science. Do you have any projects that you would like me to promote and feed into? And I got crickets back, nothing, nothing, nothing. And eventually somebody came back to me and said, oh, what is the citizen science thing? Because I might have something like that is related. And then I heard nothing back. Um, and then somebody coincidentally um, had seen my advertising of the iNaturalist workshop and was working on campus um, and independently was actually the organizer of the City Nature Challenge and was so excited and put me in touch with the San Diego State University Biodiversity Museum, which was actually the person that had reached out to me in the beginning. And it turns out that all the data of the San Diego City Nature Challenge feeds into our very own biodiversity museum. And it was in conjunction with the San Diego Natural History Museum, but it was kind of like this really roundabout way of having to build these relationships first and then getting like, oh, this is what we're doing and all this data um, kind of feeds into that. So it was really exciting to see how that works. And I'm not going to go into the details because it's very similar to the BioBlitz that uh, Vivian had mentioned. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to share some of the results of this was literally just a month long and this is just the beginning of we're hoping a, a, like a year long program it won't just be in the month uh, just from our month we've had 400 plus views on our libguide our workshop attendance um, uh, our workshops that we held were actually on uh, during our farmers market which is a really busy area and it's just outside the library we chose that time because there were there would have been uh, a lot of participation hopefully uh, 71 participants that we directly engaged with for the all of us, five of those participants actually gave their data. And it was more than I had ever imagined because I never thought that students would give their data because they had to do blood samples um, and other health information. So that was really exciting that they did that. Litter Journal, we had 27 engagements. And I unfortunately cannot track any of that data because it obviously goes to the South Carolina Museum. So that was really hard. 
Um, and then the iNaturalist, we engaged with 84. And that was really kind of exciting because a lot of those came specifically for us. We were part of the San Diego City Nature um, calendar. So they sent people to us. We were public for that. Um, and then the City Nature Challenge shared their results with us, which was really exciting for San Diego County. There were 28,633 observations, 2,009 uh, 2,900 species were identified, of which 145 were rare or endangered or threatened. There were over 1,000 observers and 900 identifiers. And those are all crowdsourced and they volunteers in that. So it was kind of exciting to see some of that. And our, our, as a result of this, we have now, um, we will be doing programming with them as well as our county and public libraries to uh, really develop this program further. Next slide, please. So in addition to some of the challenges um, that we were mentioned by Vivian, uh, one of the biggest challenges for me was finding projects relevant to our local community. Um, but hopefully there will be some kind of snowballing from that now that we have started. Um, and the opportunities were really to provide hands-on education about what participatory science is and the SDGs. And this was kind of really exciting for me because most of the people that were walking past in the farmer's market are the students, faculty, staff. Um, many of them had no idea what this was. When I started uh, saying, oh, do you know about citizen science? They were like, no idea. When I mentioned community science, they were like, oh. And then when I actually said what we were doing, they were like, oh, I'm like a marketing major. Can I really take part in this? This is like so exciting. So that was really kind of exciting for me. And then uh, the other real opportunity was just fostering those relationships to enhance student success in our community with our faculty um, and with students. And then our broader community with uh, these projects like the City Nature Challenge, the San Diego Natural History Museum, hopefully um, our Zoo and Wildlife Alliance next year. Um, and then obviously the bigger, the bigger communities like the All of Us. Next slide, please. And that was my presentation. Thank you very much. And any questions for any of us? Sarah, so nice. Uh, I mean, so, so extensive um, uh, an activity in the reach. It's great that you've done this uh, national uh, outreach network. I, I had a question about uh, policy impact. So uh, you do these projects, you collect data, and they'll have or could have effect on, you know, local policy. Are we going to spend more money on picking up litter or we're going to do it like the Japanese do and just going to not have any litter receptacles anywhere, make everybody responsible for others. You know that they don't, they, you can't throw it in. Uh, but the question about impact on policy, is there a strategy for that? Or you just look for opportunities where the work may apply to a policy question. In sure. terms of what we are doing, in terms of what we are doing, um, I had just initially chosen these low entry um, level, but definitely what we are looking for in the future is to really tie into uh, like local policy, um, broader policy if we need to. I do have to have a disclaimer here as well, which I never mentioned in the beginning, is that I'm very privileged in the part of world where I work that I can do this work freely. So I feel that it is important very much to tie what we are uh, doing into policy eventually, because I know that there are a lot of um, academic libraries in particular whose hands are tied with this work and they're having to reframe what they are doing. They can do it similarly, but with more barriers. So I feel that really we need to be advocating. So that is de definitely the next step is really working with our local uh, policy makers to see where they need um, this data and how we can effectively use the data. Obviously, this is was just the beginning for us. I need to now really be able to assess this data, to be able to assess it, which um, is going to be more complicated. But really, there are people that are doing this, is to find those people, um, seeing what uh, objectives they need, what outcomes they need, and then providing the data that we are collecting to back that up. Your point about networking and relationship building, uh, and there's so much going on 
it's difficult to know. Uh, but yet, there often you do find people that are doing things very compatible uh, with with your efforts and can compound those. Uh, Beth, ask if you know of other academic libraries doing this same work. Actually, I do not know of any that are actually doing the programming. Um, I had borrowed uh, my LibGuide originally from Ratkers, who had done this, and Carnegie Mellon, who had produced uh, citizen science uh, LibGuides, both of them. I reached out to them first and I said, can I please use you as an example? They just had LibGuides on citizen science and what citizen science is, but they didn't look like in, well, in those LibGuides that they were actually doing any programming towards it. So I don't know whether that tied into any coursework that they were doing. Um, and they, they, both of those, when I reached out to those librarians, were not personally doing any of the programming. Um, it's possible that some of those departments were doing it, um, but it is definitely something that we can promote amongst academic libraries. And, and to be honest, I'm not doing any of this work. I am literally just doing the relationship building, getting my community excited and feeding into other projects in our area. So um, we don't have um, at this stage any um, of the kits like Vivian had has in her library. I would love to do that. Um, we just don't have the funding for that at the moment. And um, so I'm really just tying into what we have at the moment. Uh, but I really do feel that it is all about relationship building, finding what projects need it and what projects just need the advertising. You know, how can we help them support that and, and eventually for the policy making? understand yes uh eric mentions that uh michigan state has a project there in the chat you can see what he's saying about that looks interesting oh, that's awesome that is yeah. awesome yeah, yeah i will reach out to them okay good good uh vivian i had a question about uh age you you said you were doing these programs for all different ages what ages are you having the most success with? Uh, mostly uh, children and teens. Um, uh, children, actually, let me rephrase that, it's children and adults. And teens, it's like hit and miss in certain, in certain okay. different library branches because you have to do something um, that's engaging enough to get them. And the good news is a lot of citizen science projects nowadays are created in the gamify way. So when you approach them as a, as a citizen science game project, then um, you, it's easier for you to get them, uh, to attract them to attend the programs. And then the thing we did is we offer them volunteer hours. Um, not a whole lot, but because there is a requirement for them to graduate from high school with the volunteer hours. So we, when they join us to become what we call the CD, um, the uh, teen council in different branch libraries, the teen librarian would, would let them know about our citizen science project or neighborhood science projects and then encourage them to participate. And by the way we're tracking their participation is using size starters uh, platform, which you can use that to track their, um, the observation they logged on um, the time that they, they, they go into different, um, different projects that they have participated. And from there, that's how we figured out how many hours to give it to them. Just, just to add some complexity to your program already. I mean, you've got different, so different motivations for age levels. It's, uh, you know, it's like they're all completely different programs. I'm imagining, but the the, it's interesting to, that that there could be programs that they could share an interest around where people of different ages could work together on on these things. Uh, uh, one more question: inside or outside? Where's where more? Which are more popular? Outside. Outside, okay, <laughs> great. Uh, we, have run, we have run over time a little bit, uh, but this is not a TV show, though we want to respect everybody's time and we thank everyone for who's still here staying with us, uh, but uh, we'll probably need to close it out now. So we're gonna ask you for final comments. Sarah, would you like to leave us with something? I would just like to say that don't be scared to take on these projects. Um, I feel that the sustainability work, it's okay not to be perfect in it. And just to look for things, what you can do within your means and within your budget um, and just keep on going. Great. Couldn't say it better. Vivian. I agree with Sarah 100%. 
um, citizen science programs in your library does not always have to have money tie into it. A lot of these programs are, these projects are free. Again, if you go to Size Starter, there's over 4,000 different projects. You will find something that works for your, that is of an interest of your community. So look through them. And I highly encourage all librarians, all libraries to take on this because this is really one way to bring the activism on environment, on climate change to a different level. Um, you do not have to always think about, I'm going out there to protest to, you know, there, this is a different way of protesting. You give, you are giving your community member a voice by having them participate in the, these real scientific research. Absolutely. And the one thing leads to another is, is the way it always works. And so you two are to be highly praised and complimented for your work. This is so important. It, it needs to expand. I, I hope we'll be able to help you do that. And thank you so much for taking the time today. It's, it's been choice. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you.